Not every Jew is a chosen child of Israel. I've shown you that the Jewish narrative and the Muslim narrative on Palestine are very similar. They agree on temples, they agree on pilgrimages, they agree on sacrifices. In particular, they agree that the Temple of Solomon was a holy building, a holy site that was dedicated to the worship of the one true God. And they agree that the children of Israel were chosen by God to build that temple, to be its custodians and to rule over it. But there's one crucial difference between the two narratives. The Jewish narrative is ethnic. It says that God chose the children of Israel because of their ethnicity. It says that he has a special relationship with them and that special relationship is based on their descendants from Israel, the great prophet of God, the prophet Jacob, Yaqub alayhi salam. And that means that the children of Israel have a special privileged relationship with God based on their ethnicity. And it means that they have a special privilege over the Temple of Solomon, which used to stand right here. It says that they have an exclusive right based on their race to the Temple of Solomon and that the Dome of the Rock should be torn down and replaced with a Jewish temple, a reconstructed Temple of Solomon that's controlled exclusively by the children of Israel. This is where the Muslim narrative corrects the Jewish narrative. According to the Muslim narrative, there's only one true God and we all have equal access to him. That one true God does not discriminate between people based on their race. The children of Israel and everyone else, all other human beings have equal access to that God. Yes, that one true God did choose the children of Israel, but that wasn't a racial privilege. It was a moral privilege that God gave to them because they submitted to him and worshiped him alone. God chose them because of their submission to him. And this submission was modeled and it reached its peak in the lives of great human beings like Moses, like Aaron, like David, like Solomon, like all of the other great prophets of the children of Israel that God chose to be from among the children of Israel. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that whenever one prophet amongst the children of Israel died, he was replaced by another prophet so that he could lead, he could be the religious leader of the community and guide them. They were always in direct contact with God revelation from God to someone among them. These prophets, they taught the children of Israel how to submit to God. And anyone who obeyed these prophets and submitted to God was a chosen child of Israel. And anyone who rejected them and did not submit to God was not a chosen child of Israel. God also empowered the children of Israel. He empowered them so that they could guarantee freedom of religion and religious protection at the Temple of Solomon for anyone who wanted to come to worship the one true God at the Temple of Solomon. The worship of God and submission to Him was for everyone. It wasn't just for the children of Israel. And the children of Israel were chosen to be representatives of God to the rest of the world. That's why when the Prophet Solomon, upon him be peace, invited the Queen of Sheba to submit to God, to worship God alone, to accept him as God's messenger. And remember, the Queen of Sheba is Arabian. She's from Yemen. She's not a child of Israel, but she accepted. And in the Quran, it says that she said, Aslamtu ma'a Sulaymana. I submit. Islam, Muslim, is someone who submits. I submit with Solomon. I accept him as a prophet of God. Lillah. I submit to Allah, to God, Rabbil Alameen, who is the Lord of everyone. Not just the children of Israel, but he's the Lord of everyone. The prophets and messengers of the children of Israel weren't given the mission by God to actually take this message of 
worship of him alone to everyone in the world, but anyone that they interacted with, that was their message to them. And they invited them to submit with them to God. It goes back to the time of Moses when Pharaoh, when he drowned, as he drowned in the water, the Quran, it says his final words as he was drowning were, Amantu, Annahu la ilaha illa allazi amanat bihi banu Israel wa ana min al Muslimin. His last words as he was drowning were, I have believed that there's no God except the one who the children of Israel believed in and I am from among those who submit. Muslim is somebody who submits. That means that the Prophet Moses, upon him be peace, wasn't just calling Pharaoh to set the children of Israel free, he was also calling him to worship the one true God and to accept Moses as a messenger from God. This universal nature of the religion of the children of Israel is, you can even see it historically. In Arabia, there was an Arabian Jewish kingdom. It's called the Himyarite kingdom of Arabia. These were Arabian Jews, non-Israelites, Arabians who converted to Judaism and they had a powerful kingdom in Southern Arabia for a very long time. This is around the area where the Queen of Sheba used to be, so it makes sense for them to convert to the religion that the Queen of Sheba converted to. The Quran makes all of these corrections to the Jewish narrative, and it also says that the Holy Land, Jerusalem, and the area around it is a land that God has blessed for everyone. Lil Alameen. Not just for the children of Israel, but for everyone. The Jewish narrative originally was just like this Muslim narrative, but then it was changed by the hands of men. From the original universal narrative in which the children of Israel worshipped God alongside other races, alongside other ethnicities, into a racial narrative in which the children of Israel had a special privileged relationship with God. And in this narrative, the Temple of Solomon, the Temple of Jerusalem, belongs exclusively to them by virtue of their ethnicity. I'm going to prove to you that the Jewish narrative is a mistake. Not from the Quran, but from the Bible and from the history of the Jewish people that they wrote themselves. You can find full references for everything that I'm going to say now in the description below. Solomon and the children of Israel built the Temple of Solomon to worship God and to submit to Him. And they did this not just for the children of Israel, but for anyone else who wanted to submit to God and worship Him alone. The people who weren't from the children of Israel were divided into two groups. The first group were those who believed in God, worshipped Him alone, and accepted the, the prophets of the children of Israel as prophets of God and submitted to God through these great prophets. These people, non-Israelites, they were allowed in the temple and they did worship God in the temple of Solomon just as the children of Israel did. The other group of non-Israelites, Gentiles, were those who worshipped idols did not worship the one true God, did not submit to God through the prophets that God sent through the children of Israel. These people were not allowed to worship at the temple because they were impure. In order to worship at the temple, similar to the way uh, you have to worship in mosques today, in order to enter a mosque, a Muslim mosque, you have to be pure. You have to take a purificatory bath, you have to purify yourself, and that purification requires being Muslim. So in those times, there was a means of purification, and people who did not accept the message of the Israelite prophets were impure, were not allowed to worship in the temple. There were two kinds of Gentiles. The Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles in the Bible, they both describe a beautiful prayer of dedication that Solomon made when he first constructed the temple. He prayed to God, and his prayer included a prayer for those non-Israelites, people who weren't from the children of Israel. In the language of the translations of the Bible today, these people are called foreigners. He prayed for them because he loved them and he wanted them to be guided. And he wanted to facilitate their worship and submission to the one true God at the temple. 
He said that if any foreigner comes to this temple that I have made because of your great name, in other words, to worship you alone, he's not an idol worshiper, he's a believer. He said, and because of your outstretched hand, in other words, in order to make a prayer to you, to ask you for something, in order to seek your generosity, to fulfill his needs in this life and the next life, then Solomon prayed to God, hear them from heaven. In other words, accept their prayer. Muslims have a similar um, statement in every time when we pray, we say, Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allah hears the one who praises him. In other words, he accepts the prayers, he answers the supplications of the one who praises him. Solomon here is saying, accept the prayer of this foreigner who's come to the temple for the sake of your name. And then he says, do whatever the foreigner asks you. In other words, answer all his prayers. Why? So that all the people on earth, in Arabic we would say, Al-Alameen, all beings, all the people on earth may know your name and fear you. Solomon made the temple so that everyone, the children of Israel, as well as people who weren't from the children of Israel, could come there and worship God alone, praise Him and submit to Him alone. The Bible and Jewish historical sources, they explain that God made a special covenant with the children of Israel. That if they honored God and submitted to Him, then God would honor them and make them custodians of His temple so that they could be the representative of God to all the nations of the world. But if they didn't honor Him, if they didn't submit to Him, if they didn't obey Him, then He would destroy them and He would destroy their temple too. In the 400 or so years after Solomon built his temple, the children of Israel, many among them, they stopped submitting to God. They disobeyed Him. They even worshipped idols. And so God sent them prophets, one after another. And these prophets, they called the children of Israel back to God to repent to God, to repent from their sins, to submit to God, to obey Him. But the children of Israel, a large number of them, rejected these prophets and even killed them. This is well-known history that's there in the Bible, it's in the Talmud, it's in the history of the Jewish people themselves. This well-known history, it tells us that when the children of Israel, they rejected their prophets and they killed them, then God unleashed an evil Babylonian king against them. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. About 400 years after the Temple of Solomon was built, Nebuchadnezzar, he conquered Jerusalem, he slaughtered the children of Israel, he enslaved the few of them that survived, and he destroyed the Temple of Solomon. And for about 100 years, there was no temple and the children of Israel lived in captivity, in slavery in Babylonia. I'm going to pause this history for a moment. I want you now to see two things. I want you to see that according to the Bible itself, the worship of God and submission to Him at the blessed Temple of Jerusalem is for all people. It's not just for the children of Israel. And I want you to see that according to the Bible itself, the children of Israel do not have a racial entitlement to the temple. If that were the case, he wouldn't have destroyed the temple, he wouldn't have destroyed them. This means that the children of Israel are not racially entitled to the temple. It's based on their obedience to him, it's based on their submission to God. And all of this shows that not every child of Israel is chosen by God. They're only chosen by God if they emulate the great prophets, the great saints, the great righteous people from among them, from among the children of Israel. Those were the people who were chosen by God. And by emulating them, the children of Israel can become chosen by God. Those were the people who deserve to be custodians of the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. And by emulating them, the children of Israel can become custodians of the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. But if a child of Israel sinned and disobeyed God and rejected his prophets, then he didn't deserve to be chosen by God. He didn't deserve to be a custodian of the Holy Temple of Jerusalem. The Holy Temple 
would be taken away from them. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the first temple was all about. But even after God's punishment, as long as you're alive in this life, the door to repentance is always open. And whenever a child of Israel repents, he can become chosen by God again. And that's what happened. According to Jewish sources, the children of Israel repented to God, wholeheartedly submitted to Him. They asked God to forgive them. They stopped disobeying God. They stopped sinning. And so God honored them and He gave them the temple back and He restored them to Jerusalem. This happened about a hundred years after the destruction of the temple. And it happened with the help of a Persian king who was not from the children of Israel. The name of this Persian king as mentioned in the Bible is Cyrus the Great. He defeated the Babylonians and he restored the children of Israel to Jerusalem and he helped them rebuild the Temple of Solomon. This is a foreigner, a Gentile, someone who's not from the children of Israel, who is hallowing the name of God at the Temple of Solomon. He's one of the people that Solomon himself prayed for. This is further evidence that the religion of the children of Israel, which, to put it simply, is just worship God alone, don't associate partners with Him, and submit to Him whatever He says. It's as simple as that. This religion of the children of Israel was for everyone. It wasn't just for them. And other people, foreigners, Gentiles, could become chosen by God too. That's why in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, it says that Cyrus the Great was someone who was anointed by God. That means he was chosen by God. So when the children of Israel repented, God restored them to Jerusalem. And with the help of Cyrus the Great, they rebuilt the Temple of Solomon. This is called the Second Temple. The Temple of Solomon is the first temple. This is the Second Temple. But then the children of Israel did what all human beings do. They fell into sin again. They disobeyed God again. And so God sent them prophets and they rejected those prophets and they tried to kill them and they did kill some of them. And so God sent them the Romans this time. In 70 AD, the Romans came and they destroyed the second temple. They desecrated it. And for 500 years, it remained in a state of ruin. The children of Israel were also destroyed and they were expelled from Jerusalem. This part of history in Jewish history is a little bit hazy because the prophets who we Muslims believe were sent to the children of Israel, prophets such as Zacharias, Zechariah, John the Baptist, Yahya, and Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, they don't believe that these were prophets. So in the Jewish narrative, they'll give some slightly different reasons for the destruction of the second temple. But the important point here is that the temple was destroyed again. It was taken away from them. They were expelled from Jerusalem again, and that all of this was a result of their sin. And that again shows that not every child of Israel is chosen by God. And it shows that the Holy Temple of Jerusalem is not an ethnic right of the children of Israel. It's only for them if they submit to God. For 500 years, the Holy Temple of Jerusalem lay in ruins. It was abandoned. It was desolate. It was neglected. It was desecrated. And the children of Israel were not allowed to return to Jerusalem. They weren't allowed to rebuild the temple. So they prayed to God to help them repent to Him again, to restore the temple once again. And God answered their prayers. He sent them someone, he sent them a prophet who called them to repent to God so that they could once again become the chosen people of God. He was someone who prayed towards the holy temple of Jerusalem, even as it lay in ruins. He's someone who even visited it when no one else in the world was there venerating it, worshiping God at it. He was someone who praised the prophets of the children of Israel. He was someone who followed the way of those chosen children of Israel. He was someone who honored the children of Israel and he called them back to the way of their illustrious ancestors. He was someone who exhorted them to follow the Torah. He was like the great prophets and the great kings of the children of Israel. His name was Muhammad. But there's just one thing. He wasn't a child of Israel. And there's a great reason for that. I'll tell you why in the next video.